Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 448th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Don Dido, Dan Cameron, and Joe Lewis. We're thrilled to have the poet Cliff Feynman here, who will read to close today's program. A few quick notes before we get started. Here at the Brooklyn Rail, we acknowledge that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions that we'll be posting shortly. Over the past 21 years here at the Rail, we've undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. This December, we are fundraising $150,000 in 31 days, and your contributions will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations at the rail for the coming year. Please check the chat for more information and links to donate, which we'll also be posting in just a moment. But now to introduce today's guest and hosts, pioneering New Orleans-based multimedia artist, Don Dado has long worked between worlds. Since the 1970s, her art has addressed an ever-widening series of gulfs between people, between cultures and communities, and ultimately between humans and the earth itself. Living and working in Louisiana, one of the fastest disappearing landmasses in the world, Dado has been grappling with urgent questions about Earth and humanity's survival for the last 50 years. A retrospective of her work is now on view at the New Orleans Museum of Art through January 23rd, 2022. And we encourage everyone to get to New Orleans right away. Our hosts today are New, or New York-based curator, art writer, and educator, Dan Cameron, who began his career with the 1982 New Museum of Contemporary Art exhibition, Extended Sensibilities, Homosexual Presence in Contemporary Art, the first museum effort in the US to examine gay and lesbian identity in art. During his 11 years as senior curator at the New Museum, Cameron organized survey exhibitions of David Bonarovich, Martin Wong, Marcel Odenbach, among many others. He is founding director of Prospect New Orleans, which assists in the cultural rebuilding of the city after Hurricane Katrina. He is an editor at large here at the rail. And last but not least, Nationally known artist, arts administrator, educator, and author, Joe Lewis is a professor in the Department of Art and was the Dean of the Claire Trevor School of the Arts at the University of California, Irvine from 2010 to 2014. He has written for Art in America, the LA Weekly, Art Forum, among many other publications. His essays regarding the confluence of art, technology, and society have been published in anthologies and peer-reviewed journals. So without further ado, Dan, passing you the mic. Well, thank you so much, Nick, um, and welcome everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor uh, to take part uh, in uh, one more uh, NSE, New Social Environment, um, which just to remind people, we started at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic uh, to find a way for us to stay in contact, to stay in connection with each other. And, you know, this is a perfect example of how the system works. I'm in New York, Dawn is in her studio in New Orleans, Joe uh, is in California, uh, and we're all able to talk about something in real time that is happening uh, in New Orleans, which is namely Dawn's retrospective. Uh, so I just wanted to say, first of all, that I want to um, really, really um, just shout out to Dawn in particular because you know, in the years that I've been involved with New Orleans, I've gotten to know her work closer and closer. And I feel that really my appreciation for it has only grown uh, in that time. And in the period when I've been able to work with her, that's when I really have felt that, you know, this is a talent and a gift that, you know, if, if, if I hate to use a cliche, but if Dawn was based in New York, which is not really possible because I don't think the work would be the same or I don't think Dawn would be the same, you know, we'd be talking about someone with a very significant national profile. So now that this retrospective is going on, I want to call attention to the fact that, you know, in the 70s when Dawn's career started, New Orleans really was part of the national conversation. Uh, I think it wasn't really until sort of the glamification of Soho and the kind of 
insurgent art market uh, of the 1980s, which, which put capital more and more at the center of art discourse. Um, up until that point, uh, Louisiana artists of Dawn's generation uh, and slightly before really were showing regularly. They were um, presenting their work nationally in, in, in major museums. And what I discovered along the way when I started working in New Orleans was that when this break occurred and you know artists who had to sort of commit to the centralization of the art market were the ones that got prioritized, that's when I realized that you know, Dawn's work really sh should have more attention. And so when we got together and started talking about this particular event, um, I think that the desire to really explore the past of Dawn's work, to, to talk about those early years before I even got to know it, um, is a good way to start a conversation like this one. And Dawn said immediately when I suggested this to her that the person to, uh, to bring into this conversation really was Joe Lewis because she and Joe had been going back um, to, to the 80s, really working together on a couple of significant projects. So with that introduction, I will actually want to turn the mic over to um, Dawn first to, to really talk about the, the 70s. Uh, and Joe, um, if you two could talk a little bit more about the work that you did together, your collaborations as artist and curator. Well, thank you, Brooklyn and Rail. Thank you, Nick, for organizing and uh, for the best dance I ever had. If I'm goo, uh, the opening of Mass Smoka on the parking lot of uh, uh, Building 6. Um, I've never danced across an entire parking lot with anyone. Uh, <laughs> here with uh, Lonnie Hawley and, and the great Denise McConish. So that's, um, anyway, that's a memory I share and a gratitude to you all. And Dan, gosh, we have worked together and I'm so grateful for the experience and enriched by it and grateful to you for drawing attention to my work today. Thank you so much. And for including Joe Lewis, who actually we met in 1980 and uh, we'll get to some of the projects we worked on together. And I uh, was uh, fully uh, enamored and respectful of Joe with the, uh, the great fashion moda uh, of New York and in the South Bronx, and, and that just wowed me and continues uh, to do the social practice you've engaged in. And going to the 70s, um, I would say that early on I was very impacted, Dan, by uh, uh, mass media, what it could do to change the dynamics. And in a city like New Orleans, we were and still are known greatly for our music but to build up an audience for visual arts and other types of performance art, we really, I thought, had to hit the street. And uh, at the time in the mid 70s, the CB radio, uh, the CB was a, the phenomena and truckers were using it, people in cars, but I thought it would be a way to uh, uh, promote social media exchange before we had internet and Facebook and and the whatnot. So, and so I installed these uh, units throughout the city, about nine of them, and had uh, people speaking who you didn't know what color they were, how much money was in their pocket, what their religion was. And it was pretty wonderful to have this exchange that went on for about three months. So I think that was my first major project and one I um, am still happy to have engaged in a lot of good experience uh, with the community. And um, I would say that early on community engagement was, was key, was a partner to any kind of aesthetic direction. And leading into uh, the early 80s, I met Joe at the conference that was held here in New Orleans for, uh, I, I think it's called the NOAA National Association of Artists Run Institutions or uh, Alternative Art Spaces. And we met in the eight, 1980, and I had done a project uh, called Art in America, The Traveling Show. It was at the outbreak of the big uh, blockbuster shows that seemed to dominate the art conversation. So I had five Winnebago's and different artists uh, participating with installations and we brought the art out to different neighborhoods and it was a great project and was commissioned actually for this conference. I met Joe there. And um, 
I could go on more into my uh, early days with Joe, but uh, should I turn the floor to Joe or continue? I think Dan's, uh, well. Yeah, I think, should we pass over to Joe? Joe, I know that uh, we, uh, after we met in 1980, I, I introduced you to Martin Green, local artist Martin Green, who uh, actually I studied art with as a child, <laughs> and uh, also to David Butler, and I sent some work up for your great show at the New Museum. I think that was also 1980, December of 1980. And uh, I'll turn it over to you and you can tell the rest of our story, Joe. Okay, thanks. And also, thank you for, uh, for Nick and uh, Dan and Dawn for bringing me into this conversation. What Dawn did not say was that she was the demolition derby queen. <laughs> not, I think it was 1976 in New Orleans. Uh, you know, we'd known each other for 40 years and, um, uh, it, you know, meeting Dawn in that arena was really fantastic because you know, we both had a, a similar idea about where art should be. And I want to say this is pre um, social practice, right? This is like, this is like, well, way before that idea was even an idea. Um, Fashion Moda had a, a satellite gallery in New Orleans for a while. And that was kind of part of our conversation and our collaboration. Um, and, you know, when I, I was down there for another conference and Dawn showed me this work she was working on a call. Well, it wasn't called Soul Shadows at that point. She had got a uh, grant from, uh, I guess, the prisons of the city to do some project, to do a piece on the new uh, prison in town. And instead of like doing a sculptural piece or a, um, um, a mural, Dawn decided to create some programming to bring into the prison. And this was, you know, when I heard about this, I was just like stunned by it. I mean, it was, you know, because first of all, very unusual for that kind of interaction to happen. She worked with juvenile offenders. She worked with the, uh, the in the women's jail uh, and uh, at the same time, there was a, um, a murder that happened on actually Dawn's block uh, of a millionaire guy. And, you know, when Dawn was working with these juveniles, it was like the big story of the time. Uh, so she told these kids, look, I'm going to go check this out and see what's, you know, see what's happening. And at that, going to that court, is really kind of the, the beginning of the story that I like to tell about Dawn because she walks into the court and there's the, you know, there's like the family, the person who got murdered on one side, all white. And then there's the family and relatives and friends of the defendants on the other side, all black. And she just sat down on the black side, you know, kind of just did that. And, you know, during the break, uh, some guy came up to us and said, what are, you, what are you doing sitting on our side? You know, like, who are you? That person happened to be Wayne Hardy, who uh, at the time was one of the most notorious gang members in, uh, he and his brother in New Orleans. And, you know, that's where this conversation really takes off. Um, and, you know, um, the thing that really struck me about all of this was just, Dawn was just kind of, in a sense, very fearless and just <laughs> kind of going into this thing. Uh, probably today, maybe not, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, she, she starts talking to Wayne and Wayne says, uh, look, you know, he realized he had just beat a capital murder case and he realized like, you know, where he was going, where his life was going. And I like to say that, you know, in the life, in the, the gangster criminal life, you know, it is a, a labyrinth of one way dead end streets. And the only way out is like in a pine box, six feet under or in a, under the jail and then in a pine box. And Don, you know, goes back to these kids and says, yeah, I met, you know, the Hardy boys. And they said, oh yeah, yeah, that's, you know, you, they would never talk to you. They, you know, they would like, you, you gotta be kidding because everyone knew them. And she gets, you know, Wayne to do this uh, interview and he starts talking about getting out the life and she brings that interview into the juvenile hall and 
the kids are stunned that she has this interaction with Wayne. You want to take it from there? Uh, well, I, I think we could progress through some of the images because I, I'll show you what rocked my world. Um, keep going, um, Nick. This was uh, a book that I did with the um, inmates, and this was the section with the juveniles, 96 juveniles serving juvenile life, and this is some of their writings. We did many, many projects, but we'll continue uh, with the slide. This is in the book. The book was called Book of Judgments. Uh, this is uh, Dalton Prejean was the youngest uh, person to be executed in the state of Louisiana for a while. So I served his last meal. Um, keep, keep rolling. Um, here we get into what Joe was talking about with the Hardy Boys and the upcoming slides. This is a transcript of the interviews, considerable interviews I did with Wayne and his brother, Paul. We moving on. That's uh, Paul Hardy and Wayne is to his left or right, depending on your view. And we keep going. Here is the slide I wanna show you. So I'm in a dorm for a year with these um, 96 guys who I've gotten to know well. They just thought I was teasing them. And I said, I was gonna show them uh, a piece interview I'd done with Wayne Hardy. They, they just, and when I showed it, when this came on the monitor, you, you know, it was total silence and this went on for over an hour. You can continue. Uh, okay. So all of this material um, working inside the prison and then working with uh, the gang members, because it was at that moment a revolving door, New Orleans. Um, we can um, talk about all of the horrors of uh, penal institutions and as modern day slave camps, et cetera. But we still have to remember that there were 6,000 inmates locked in there. And so I was very uh, pleased uh, and honored to have an opportunity to give their voice a public uh, dynamic, a public audience. So here is the book of judgment uh, with pages from the book around next slide. Next. I have to say this, uh, these images are when the, the work was shown in New Orleans and it, the exhibition was just packed. It really, the community came out for it and um, it was very rewarding. Next. This is me at the time uh, working with the, uh, my juvenile team on a piece called Soul Shadows and we're, I can show these faces now, but you couldn't then, they were serving juvenile life. Next um, is a little dicky. Anyway, I got to be very close to these guys. Some of them uh, certainly caught in a rat race with multiple murders, et cetera. But, you know, they were just kids. I mean, you know, really kids keep going. And Don, how did these images fig figure into the work, Soul Shadows? Well, I think we're the next slide are the soul shadows. Yeah. Can I just jump in for a second here and just say that at the time when Dawn was collecting this material, I think it's important to say that it was like, you know, unedited first voice, authentic voice. This idea that we're looking at now really hadn't even just stated, right? I mean, it was just kind of, you know, she was in involved in this community uh, on the inside and on the outside. Right, because at that time she's still building a relationship with Wayne and and Paul, um, and you know this is a, a, a about the moment I met uh, Dawn when we started talking about this show, which went to Baltimore, um, and then you know it comes together as a kind of installation, bringing all these disparate parts together, which includes videos, um, these uh, images, kind of. Uh, transmogrified, um, and then the physical setup of the actual piece. Yeah, and it was about a seventh, over a 7,000 square foot in, uh, installation that ended up traveling and how all of the prison experience and documentation worked into the traveling show Soul Shadows in America House. 
is a lot of the raw video documents unedited. I know there's no you know objectivity, but I tried my damnness. So all unedited uh, video and some of the writing, and then some of my own interpretation uh, was also included in, in certain rooms. It was uh, 10, 10 rooms of video, a central corridor, uh, Hall of Judgment, again, corresponding to the book, and then a final chamber where Wayne Hardy uh, worked collaborative with me to pose as warriors, uh, the great warrior throughout the ages. And that's because it became apparent to me that one of the big quests here was a quest for self-esteem far more than money, far more than, you know, kind of a lust for, for murder and that kind of, uh, well, anyway, it was, it, it was about self-esteem too. So the, the path of the warrior, you can keep rolling. Um, these were the, some of the photographs you had seen earlier, the shadows of all of us worked into this piece, which was a video and also 48 still frames that were four feet by eight feet that formed the images of the corridor uh, mixed with many soundtracks. Uh, love, you can keep rolling. Um, here are the doors. Um, there were doors on two sides of the central corridor, and these doors will segue into the current retrospective. Uh, it's a series of photographs taken of doors around New Orleans in 1989, and then I added one in 1991, which is at the height of the Gulf War. Not the height, well, the end of January, and it's a door with an American flag on it. But the, the, you can go to the next slide. Um, inside each of those chambers, there were videos, uh, video offerings. And uh, one of the 10 was one that was uh, kind of an art uh, edited in a, a way that I guess fell outside of documentary. Um, next. Um, this was Wayne posing as different warriors. You can see Christ at the end of this chamber who was a warrior, uh, certainly in his own right, uh, keep going. Then I think two important ones that ended up actually in the Whitney Black Male exhibition uh, was Wayne Hardy posed as John Wayne, Wayne Hardy posed as Rambo. This was very important to me because you have to keep in mind I was doing this work when David Duke is running for office here, the Klansman. And he's got part of his uh, exploitation strategy uh, is, is kind of baiting everyone saying that the violence in the city is a predisposition of race. And of course the stats were mostly young black males 24 years or younger, killing young black males 24 years of, or younger. So. This, this I answered back to David Duke. I'm saying, oh no, 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 this wasn't uh, something uh, imported from Africa. This is a made in America experience. So here, I was posing uh, with with Wayne's uh, collaborative input, him as Wayne as uh, you know cowboy, and then Rambo. These were kind of current pop things at uh, pop imagery at the time. And this came out of interviews with the 96 guys I was working with. Uh, even the Hardy Boys thought they got their name that the, the press were calling them the, the Hardy Boys because they were some Chicago gangster group or a Wild West posse. I went, no, that was a series of books, uh, you know, about two boys who became detectives. I said, no. So I have that on tape when, I, when they realized it wasn't this kind of, aspired Chicago gangster kind of vibe. Um, anyway, let's keep rolling here. This one's important, Wayne Hardy as the Frog Prince. Um, you know, I think it was about trying to, again, self-esteem, climb the ladder. And if you're not allowed access to the mainstream, then you'll find your glory, you know, in another way. And uh, a lot of the kids I worked with, clearly uh, life offered, nothing but death, so they embrace, embrace death for glory. But here, the frog prince, it's a, a cry out to society, could you please kiss me, give me a little kindness, I am in fact a prince. And his gun necklace that he wore everywhere, it's solid gold gun with 96 diamonds, 
I said, if that were buried in the, in the ash and dug up 2000 years from now, they would think this guy was the mayor of the city. I mean, he was, you know, he had that kind of leadership. Okay, I'm going next. I guess we need to roll along. Yeah. Next. Okay, <laughs> I'll turn it to you, Dan. Well, no, I just, can you explain a little bit how this work found its way into the Whitney? Because I think that's a, um, I think it's also important to emphasize for people not in New Orleans, uh, this work is not included in the NOMA retrospective. Um, so right. we're kind of giving people a chance to see work that was deemed, um, you know, inappropriate for a museum, for that museum in this current moment in time. In this moment, um, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. But it has been Next been slide. Oh, um, we'll roll through, roll through these quickly and I'll talk over them. This was a next, hold it. Well, I think Joe's gonna wanna address that, but to your question, Dan, how did it get to the Whitney? I think Thelma Golden actually read a very long article cover story that Joe Lewis um, wrote for, um, an art magazine based out of LA called Art Spaces. And she read it and she was putting together the show and called me and asked me if I would participate. And I, I did and we had uh, say three of the big icons were in it. I was really fighting to have Wayne Hardy's voice in the show too, but was unsuccessful. I thought in a show black male, he would have been a better spokesperson to what we had been doing. but. Nonetheless, I'm grateful to her. It was a powerful exhibition, very important. Glad to have been a part of it. And uh, that's how it landed there through Joe. And now drive by shooting. Sorry, Joe, go ahead. That's okay. So this is, <laughs> this is something that uh, always kind of amazes me. You know, uh, Wayne and Paul say, hey, Dawn, you know, come, come in our car and she drives around with them. And you got to realize that Wayne took 13 bullets, you know, before he died. He, he died on the 14th time he got the 14th bullet that pierced his body. She's in the car and there's one moment where she's in the car and they say, hey, wait right here. We'll be right back. And they jump out of the car and go into the projects. And then the police kind of swarm the projects and Wayne and Paul come out the back and get back in the car and drive away. I, I don't, I, I, uh, I, if you can just imagine that and Dawn sitting there, you know, in this space, you know, white woman, blonde hair, et cetera, et cetera, just gonna la di da la, right? But I say this because later the aftermath of this, of the Hardy Boys is the fact that uh, they, Paul in particular becomes a, uh, gets involved with the, the corrupt police in New Orleans and does a kills a witness and he gets arrested for that and gets sentenced to death, which has been commuted. But the FBI kind of does this thing, sees this material and raids Dawn's house to get this information. And one of the things they're looking for, and if you when you see the list, it's checked off drive-by shooting. They take that as material, uh, you know, material for the case, right? But this is like not a real drive-by shooting. It's a, you know, it's kind of, it's a faux drive-by shooting. Um, so, so from beginning of when Don meets Wayne to Wayne's death, to his brother working with the corrupt police in New Orleans, all of whom get arrested and get put into prison. I mean, that, that kind of encapsulates this show, even though it's not directly part of the show because the, the actual exhibition takes place prior to this. Yeah. Next slide, I think we'll show. That's Joe. <laughs> That's Joe when I met him and brought him to see Joe, uh, to meet Martin Green, who was my big buddy colleague, art, art fellow. And at the top it's, you know, it's fashion moda, but it's actually, the word fashion in English, Russian, Chinese, and Spanish in the late 70s, which predates globalism or predates all this other stuff. And one of the reasons why I was in New Orleans was like, we believed that art could be made anywhere by anyone. And we brought New Orleans artists to New York. 
you know, we brought California artists to New York, we brought Texas artists to New York, we put them in a new museum. Um, and this was, you know, this was our belief and it's still my belief to this day. At that time, people thought if you didn't go to New York, you couldn't be a real artist. And I think Dan kind of, kind of touches on this at the beginning of his introduction to Dawn. Yeah, you know, the artists kind of showing, you know, everywhere showing in major venues, but not really respected for, for their creative process. This is the piece that, <laughs> that Joe Lewis wrote for Art Space magazine, and it also became Exhibit A when the FBI kind of did their raid. Okay, <laughs> next. Exhibit A. And then I guess uh, we'll turn it over to to our wonderful Dan Cameron. I'll say the only other thing in this time period, which Dan will touch on, is a piece almost touching you that is in the retrospective where I was doing some pieces related to the AIDS epidemic and uh, the floor is all yours, Dan. Well, I, we, when, when we're through talking about the pieces that we did together, um, we're actually gonna visit that work and some others from the, from the retrospective. But you know, there's a big jump in time here between the work that Joe and Dawn did together and then the work Dawn and I did together. This is actually a little later in the process. Um, this is Marfa, Texas. Um, an exhibition that uh, I put together for the ballroom there uh, called The World According to New Orleans. Uh, these are the road home steps. Um, this is seen in front of, of the New Orleans Museum of Art. And this is based on the idea which anyone who sort of visited, I say the Lower Ninth Ward or Gentilly in the 12 months, nine months after Katrina swept through, you would see a lot of places where the houses were swept away but the stoops remained. And, and so it was a very, very jarring notion that, you know, the thing that you would sit on, you know, because porch dwelling in New Orleans is an important social custom, you know, that that, that that part of the house had stayed, but that everything else, you know, has, had been swept away. So uh, again, this is a little bit later in our collaboration, but it's a beautiful piece that Dawn did right after uh, Katrina or shortly after Katrina that we then ended up working on together. This is a beautiful location uh, in the desert just outside of Morpha. I, I, it was just really exquisite to see this, you know, symbolism starkly laid out against the, uh, you know, the desert landscape. Uh, for me, it was very fulfilling. And didn't the train from LA to yeah. New Orleans pass right by that ranch yeah. so that in theory someone looking out of the window could could see you know a new orleans stoop <laughs> illuminated uh in the darkness we can keep going so this was the first big collaboration i did with dawn it was for prospect two uh in 2011 um based on confederacy of dunces loosely um and called uh goddess fortuna and her dunces in an attempt to make um sense of it all now this, the Brulatour house and courtyard where this was staged was not the first choice, um, but it ended up being the absolutely perfect home. Um, as anyone who knows Dawn knows that the, there's, a, there's a way that she has of maintaining a space and, and transforming a space that is really remarkable. Now we're starting to look at the exhibition itself. This is a side gallery um, with the, the, the masks and, and, and a hand, but it's really the main courtyard that has the impact. And Don, do you want to pick up the, the story a little bit about what's, what's behind the goddess Fortuna? It's a, a large rambling exhibition, as Dan points out, the core of it is in the central courtyard and we'll go to there soon. But this was in a room um, called the Confederacy of the South Room. As you know, um, the, well, as you may not know, Confederacy of Dunces really by um, John Kennedy Toole, uh, written in the 70s and published probably in the 80s, won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, he was not around to see it, but he was a medieval scholar and he uh, was drawn to Boethius, et cetera, Jonathan Swift. The title itself, Confederacy of Dunces comes from Swift you know a genius in the world because they'll be surrounded by a confederacy of, and then we add dunces. So uh, there was two parts. One, the medieval roots, which is getting into the courtyard here with 
Boethius himself uh, writing a book, Consolation of Philosophy with the goddess Fortuna and John Kennedy Toole's protagonist Ignatius talking to the goddess Fortuna here in the courtyard, appearing as- From his star. bed. From his bed, the wet bed fountain. You'd have to read the book to know why it's <laughs> called that. Um, but anyway, it's, uh, and so here the, the goddess uh, in a pepper's ghost technique dances for people to see in the courtyard. The courtyard, next slide, um, is surrounded by the dunces. The hat dunce comes from a, a monk also around the, uh, the medieval time, but uh, the pointed hat, so you have divination. But the pointed hat also reminded me of the clan and it had crossover image. So anyway, as the book has this duality, about confederacies, uh, I thought the dunces surrounding the courtyard would be impactful. Next slide. Um, then we have uh, the goddess Fortuna. This is in her chamber. This is actually a rendering of how it might have been in the museum retrospective, but uh, again, the square footage got uh, pretty tight. But uh, here, she, the, you have those masks uh, to the, to the right or left of your view. And I have them, of course, in my live screen on the wall here. And it was uh, the idea of behind every mask, a different face. And behind anonymity, there is license for cruelty or merriment. And here in New Orleans, you know, with Mardi Gras and uh, the Klan and organizations, uh, I wanted to address this duality. We have Goddess Fortuna, played by both Big Frida and Katie Red. And uh, in wonderful costume here, uh, created by Camilla Huey, that pantaloon or whatever you call that thing, just beautiful. And Katie Red uh, spins her batons, uh, which was a wonderful fortuitous event because uh, Goddess Fortuna, of course, spins our fate. And I didn't know when I cast her that she was a master baton twirler. Okay, next slide. Turn it back to you, Dan. All right, so most recently our collaboration was in Kansas City uh, for an exhibition that I was um, hired uh, to do by the city and by a group of, of philanthropists. And the core of the exhibition was an outdoor exhibition, outdoor public um, art project. And I asked Dawn right away if she wanted to take part of it. And this idea of free fall was really in gestation at that time, but it was using um, Milton's idea of free will, uh, as we see it in the, in the epic poem, P Paradise Lost, and transcribing it into the landscape in a way that represented in its own fashion, I think, a, a, a metaphor of the fall of civilization. So again, we looked around for the right spot for this, and what we found, um, was this beautiful grove. It was a walnut grove, I believe. Yes. Uh, and, and virtually all of the columns could be placed in this grove with some of them leading into slightly more hidden uh, areas. And because we had, because it was located close to our performance pavilion, uh, what we ended up doing is every time we had poetry readings, which was most weekends, we would then give the poets a bottle of red wine and some cups and point them in the direction of Dawn's installation. And usually they wouldn't come back for at least another hour and they would be exhilarated. So these piece, these uh, columns have the texts from um, Paradise Lost inscribed on them. But as you can see in the image on the right, it's reflective tape. So at night, um, the headlights passing by would light up the the wording and you could actually read the poetry even by moonlight if it was bright enough. Um, do you want to move along and see a couple more images of that? Here's the work as it's currently installed <laughs> in front of the Superdome. <laughs> well, it's almost like I had to pay the uh, dome to change their name. About six months ago, it was the Mercedes-Benz Superdome. And then in the last few months, it's the Caesars Palace Superdome. So the falling columns has a, a bit more tongue in cheek resonance. Um, the reflective vinyl I, I'll say is used, um, Milton himself when he wrote the poem uh, had gone blind and his two suffering daughters took dictation by morning. Uh, but uh, so it's a way to give back to Milton uh, 
one of his famous couplings in Paradise Lost is he wanted to make darkness visible. So voila, here, Milton, I give you what I can, as best I can, darkness visible. And uh, in doing the poem, uh, taking it on again in great depth, um, I realized that for me, Paradise Lost and the Genesis thing is not a quote of the kind of a, pro a myth of the past. I, I started to believe it was a prophecy of our future of, of Paradise Lost. Earth is our paradise. And, and I think maybe we are going through the gate now. Back to you, Dan. <laughs> well, I thank you, Dawn. Um, we are actually, we are exactly, we are exactly, well, no, I felt like we were on CNN, like back over the years. Um, I can't help myself. <laughs> I, go, I think the next image is really the retrospective, and I think our timing is just right, uh, because this is where I wanted to be at this point. Um, so we're now at, at MOCA, sorry, we're now at NOMA, um, looking at through the different pieces. So maybe you could um, give us a little walk, take us by the hand. Um, well, this was uh, an installation that was first shown from uh, 2017 to 19 at Mass Smoka with uh, in my exhibition with Lonnie Holly. It's called uh, Parlor Games and everything, of course, in disarray. Um, We'll go to the next slide. So this is the installation at the New Orleans Museum of Art, trying to give it some animation. Um, the falling columns, of course, we're in, in the far distance there, you see some boots uh, on a pedestal. Again, this is 2017 and just the question of breaking down kind of uh, institutional iconography from from the past and who gets, who's going to be on our monuments. So I put uh, concrete boots. Uh, these columns, by the way, they are old columns, uh, probably several hundred years old with these blue capitals. And then I almost thought of changing the color, just going more monochromatic with this piece. But I then suddenly came across a postcard of a courtyard in Siena with the same columns, with the same blue. So it reminded me um, of how this up and down of civilization also seen in our free fall project, uh, you know, it's, it's a continuum. We're in a moment now of change. There have been change in the past, hopefully more change in the future in a progression. Uh, in the far distance, a vanishing landscape, uh, Louisiana, again, the fastest eroding landmass in the world. And this is ground zero. That's a place in Plaquemines Parish where literally hundreds of oak trees in their, you know, 200 years old and older are dying quickly in the course of a year or two because of the intrusion of salt water. That's another long conversation, but we'll move on. So the Great Hall, of course, is the entrance, which is very dramatic um, in, in terms of architecture. And I think what you did, Don, was absolutely extraordinary in terms of lining the outer walls with the clowns and then creating this one monumental figure at the top of the stairs. Thank you, Dan. Thanks. This is um, an asteroid. Um, it's about 11 feet tall. Well, it's 10 feet, 11 inches tall that fits into this 11 inch, 11 foot nave. And uh, it's got a bit of anamorphic uh, look to it. So it resembles the clowns. We had an asteroid strike the Gulf of Mexico 66 million years ago, prompting over 70% of uh, extinction of uh, life form on earth, including dinosaurs. And it could happen again if we don't self-destruct uh, our own way before there, you know, it could happen again. So that's why this is there as a reminder of how fragile it all is. These are some of the space clowns, which I started probably 10 years ago, but this is their final manifestation. It's called the Vanquished. And uh, in their space suits still falling apart, there comes an end and they're turning into meteor chips and disintegrating. Um, did the series both for the ecology meditations, but 
prompted, I think, too, my mother was dying and just watching this kind of withering away our passage. Next uh, slide. Okay. Here are the CB radios. I know she's jumping around a bit, but. Beautiful. <laughs> Uh, here's America House. Do you want to say anything about how it looks in the museum or no? Yeah, you know, um, of course, you saw pictures earlier of uh, this very large exhibition installation. Here, we're really focused on the doors and the question of who's in jail. We, we're all in jail. You can't tuck you can't hide from it. And uh, the solution out of all of this, of course, is to work together. Um, so this is a few of the, of the series called Who's in Jail in the Noma installation, yeah. Dan, do you wanna to speak to this piece or do you want me to? Um, if you would say a little bit about it, it is a video. But yeah, I, I think you can describe it much better than I can. Well, got it. But um, if we could go back to the previous, there, this is projected life size. It's um, a man wrapped in plastic, kind of a big body com com condom, uh, uh, attempting to dance with this lovely female nude, uh, and it's to the sound uh, track Chet Baker, almost blue, and. Um, with the sound, you also hear a bit of the crinkling of this plastic, and it's done in the early 90s uh, related to a response to the AIDS epidemic. And of course, it seems as though it's a stand in for today, what we've just been through the last two years. Um, so it's projected on a, on a wall across from the doors, obviously. Okay. The uh, face of God in search of is um, a loose image interpretation of Tennessee Williams' play Suddenly Last Summer and his uh, protagonist, Sebastian, who goes on a quest each year to try to find the face of God and only then will he write his great poem. Well, I had a, a young sister who had just died and I'd seen the, uh, the TV version of the play uh, one late night, and I said to myself, gosh, uh, so, oh, wait, before I go there, Sebastian finally says he found the face of God standing on a bloodied beach in Cantata's beach after watching the hatching sea turtles come out of the sand and, and the, the, the predators, the iguanas, the birds, and the crabs. It's a big Thanksgiving feast on the island. And at the end of the day, Sebastian on the beach screams, as only Williams will put into overdrive, I've at last seen God, you know? So this brings me back into my room and to watching the movie version. And when I saw this and heard this, I said, gosh, I don't wanna find my God in consumption. That's for me, my biggest philosophical problem. So, uh, and if we are to find God in consumption, we need not leave our bedroom because we were born to break down. So this is <laughs> kind of a, a, my, it's, it's the only piece that crosses into a little autobiography because of my sister. So there's a young child's bed. And in the end of this uh, 20 minute piece, it becomes somewhat of a hospital bed. Um, there's video, it was an early uh, piece in uh, multimedia. It, uh, was uh, premiered at the Olympics, first uh, work in progress in New York, uh, thread waxing space in 1995. Uh, but at the um, Olympics, it was fully immersive. You walked into a room and high walls. At the New Orleans Museum of Art, we had a tough decision to make. We could have shown the complete immersive work, but it would have created kind of a block in the entire exhibition and kind of disjointed the flow. 
And uh, I'm very happy we went with the decision to just do a three wall projection piece so that the bed can live in the larger space together with doors, together with the mantle and other objects of domesticity that I think help tie the entire exhibition together as one big installation. Oh, I wanted to say, you don't have to go back, but for its day, um, we had projection, of course, that was synchronized on the, the bed and the walls and, and in one venue on the floor. So um, that was only possible because of computers that came onto the scene for multimedia artists. All right. In the uh, conclusion, uh, there's a last room in the, in the exhibition and I reach out again to, to Milton and uh, that's a shadow of myself kind of passing through what might be paradise to the other side. And there is a quote on the wall um, that is the very last passage of Milton about Adam and Eve going through the gate. And here I'm trying to prompt the possibility once again, that this is a tale of our future and a tale of now, and less so a mythic uh, tale of our past. I think we can keep going on the watermarkers. During um, Hurricane Katrina, we've all had our disasters. You've had uh, disasters, whether it's fires on the West Coast, hurricanes hitting New York, floods. I know Ida did as much damage and caused more death recently in New York and Brooklyn uh, than New Orleans even. It, uh, but going to the moment of Katrina, which was a big rupture for our city, and certainly one you will all remember if you're of age, the images of the Superdome and the flooding, it was, it was a pretty big whammy for our city. So this piece uh, ranges in height from four feet to 10 feet uh, in height. And it's showing different levels where the floodwaters reached in neighborhoods. And I was struck when standing in line for gas or, or uh, what is it? What's the food they give the MV, the packs of dry food? Anyway, MREs. Yeah, thank you. MREs. I was so struck when standing in these lines with people, everyone was saying, how much did you get? I got four, we top six, uh, went over my kid's head, went into my attic. No one even had to use the word water because it was such a collective experience. So this piece really grew out of these conversations I had while waiting in line. And this is a wall at the New Orleans Museum of Art where we have a cluster. They've never been shown this way before, and it's somewhat of a uniting uh, the, the larger city, and I called it Water High Rise. So, Incredible piece. Thank you. The water piece faces, uh, it's kind of a, a square piece in the middle of the exhibition where all the walls are actually black, with the exception of this arena, because the water needed the the white walls for illumination and the glass piece that you're looking at, the blue green glass uh, is several tons of shattered glass and uh, came also from a Katrina experience when I went to look for my parents' home that was near a shopping mall. The home was totally gone. Tsunami took that, took the shopping mall. But I realized I was standing 18 inches deep in shattered glass. And I was very sad, of course. And then all of a sudden the sun comes out and a few pelicans fly overhead. And I looked down and it was just dazzling. And I said, true quote, oh my God, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Now I'm standing in utter destruction, but that was the paradox. And it has, it really influenced and impacted the work I did following the Katrina experience where it is both savage and, and radiant. Uh, facing it, these burnt timbers, um, shortly after Katrina, some homeless people got into my studio at the time, which was an old horse stable, 
and uh, lit a fire to stay. It was the first cold night after Katrina. There was no water pressure. The National Guard tried to put out the fire unsuccessfully. And of a 6,000 square foot space, this is what remained. But isn't it damn beautiful, that charred, gorgeous color that we get from burnt wood? And uh, anyway, recycling it. The piece in the front um, is, well, anyway, you know how art um, in many societies is even more precious when it becomes part of ritual and when it is impacted and patinaed by ritual. So for me, this piece holds that type of um, personal power and meaning. We'll go next. I uh, had pointed out the landscape on the other, uh, in another section of the exhibition and landscape that was decimated by water. And this is a landscape confronted by fire. And uh, so I use this ring, which you'll see, for those who have put up with me the last dozen years, I bring a ring into every arena, three, my three ring circus. But why? The ring is the used to build the largest airships to date. And by what is uh, many project to be a crisis moment for us, 2045, uh, we're going to need maybe to leave Earth, some say, and we're going to need a lot of spaceships for the 9 billion people. So I use this ring uh, just to symbolize that. Ladders to get away from the fire, out of the floods. Uh, there's the landscape behind it. It's a 36-foot landscape. The day-old foster fell into the ring. Kind of my, uh, I guess, it wasn't a night, I don't know. Anyway, my vision I had of, of a possible end of time landscape. And there's the big ring, um, which has made its way in different places. I have a 50 foot ring diameter and a couple of 30 foot ring diameters. And um, I like them there as portal, uh, as a reminder that we may have to go from Florida, <laughs> you know, we may have to go A to B. And um, what's not to love about a ring? also the beginning and end of time. So this is in the museum. Yeah, we'll keep going. This was in a recent uh, exhibition in Houston at Trans Art Foundation for Art and Anthropology. Uh, and this is a, the, the front piece is Tools Escaping Definition. I've been going into kind of post-human meditations and all of this stuff that we have will, you know, just kind of what will float around until it's no more and no one to know its name or its function. Uh, it's reinterpreted in the New Orleans Museum of Art installations. Uh, next slide. Oh, well, you'll see at some point. Dirt Bowl, we'll go to dirt. Okay, you see the tools uh, escaping definition in the, uh, midsection there. And there are some other tools, kind of old oil bits. What, what were they? In the foreground, um, I did a piece called Dirt Bowl Table, just thinking, again, how sacred this big ball of dirt really is and how we all share it. And it's dirt samples I have solicited from around the world. And they're all in hand pruned bowls. And uh, I was just startled and amazed and joyous about all the different colors of the earth together, all that we share. So I, I get a little uh, maybe too soupy on this piece, but I just love that it, it, it's uniting us in my own way. And I would say that this came from a time when I was in Egypt, uh, 1982, after little after I met you, Joe Lewis, um, but I'm in Egypt, I'm in Luxor, and I'm walking around and all of a sudden looking at my feet, and I realized everywhere I looked on the ground, it wasn't just dirt that we grow crops in, it was particles of culture, you know, a little bit of the temple, a shard of pottery, and I picked it up, and I, I you know, it was just this 
a very gestalt moment for me uh, about time and we're all passing through. So this dirt is not only our own ash, but it is our culture. And if we, you know, it's our art, it's everything. Next. Okay. Dan, do you want to, you want me to keep going like this? <laughs> I do. I think this is actually the, the, the climactic piece of the show. So um, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get it more into a shared conversation okay. um, with this one, but this is, this is really worth spending a few minutes on, I think. Well, I will introduce it and then turn it over to you. Um, again, you know, in these post-human ponderings, what is left? And I usually, I've been working on a series for a good while called Souvenirs of Earth. And it's really what can fit in your hand. If, you, if I can bring you all to that, those images of Afghanistan recently, those cargo planes with people escaping for their lives, no place for suitcases. What, what's in your hand? And uh, this is a, a piece a little big for one hand. It's a two-hander. I think it's uh, about 20 inches high, but it's a statue I found uh, uh, very damaged uh, in a salvage store. And it just struck me. Uh, and I decided uh, when I was looking through my souvenirs of earth, what's the last souvenir? So, well, maybe Mary, Mother Mary. Mother Earth. So I uh, did a, a 70 foot video projection that takes this statue uh, from Earth into outer space. And uh, again, post-human, she's just floating there like a rock, like a meteor, one of which you have in, on my screen. Um, so she's floating out there nameless. And uh, I'm hoping by tracing her orbit, we trace a bit of the history of our humanity. Um, okay, so we'll look at another one. So this is a, um, the back images aren't quite uh, dark as they should be, et cetera, but this will give you a sense of the room with the 70 foot curved wall and the statue uh, meeting you in the entryway to this space. We'll go next. Um, there is kind of a, a beginning. We have the big bang, of course, that created the universe and we're all moving still in the trajectory of that explosion. But the earth too may have its own big bang or will have its own big bang. So that's kind of what I start with. And um, so here is a fiery moment uh, kind of at the end of earth. Okay. This is, this is a, the statue, but against her, it looks very abstract here, but it's a 70, you take her body which you're seeing on the vertical and you turn it on the horizontal and I have her floating through deep space. Her figure becomes 70 feet in length on the horizontal. Okay. We'll go another one. Slide. I think Donna, I think that's our last image in the slide. Oh, oh. great. Well, okay. wow. It's very dramatic. <laughs> um, Dawn, before we move into the questions, and I know Joe might have something else he wants to say, I'm struck for the first time by something, and maybe you can just respond to it, which is that, you know, what we're, we're looking at contemporary art, but the way it's staged, it's almost this mirroring effect where we're standing in the future, far into the future, and then we're looking back to the past, but the past is now. So we're sort of seeing through contemporary art, we're seeing a, a, an idea of the present or the near future that will only be legible to those who are far in the future. And, and I think this way of that history and, and the present and the future seem to change positions in your work is, is really um, stunning, especially because you're dealing with such urgent questions of, of the environment. Thank you, Dan, I'm glad that comes through. Uh, it's certainly something I want to do to be cognizant of the deep past and the far future I, and where we are today. So I'm, I'm so grateful to hear that resonates for you. Yeah, I'd like to also kind of point out, I, I'll say these four words, Milton Williams Boethius Hardy. <laughs> You know, I mean, the thing that really jumps out to me about the work is your commitment to research and deep dive, but not only just kind of looking at 
the the uh, the face value of something, but connecting that back to you know where we are. It's something that you know Dan just kind of articulated a little better than I have, and um, you know these all these pieces kind of fit together. Uh, when I think about the idea of communication from the CB uh, piece through soul shadows, which is this, you know, uh, a, a kind of external internal look at uh, society from in New Orleans, all this kind of base New Orleans stuff to, you know, Katrina, which did uh, what took, um, you know, um, oh, which, which just kind of just leveled um, an entire society basically, um, and which has not really kind of come back to where it was. I mean, it, it changed New Orleans in the way that, um, you know, um, the Cross Bronx Expressway took years to change New York. Katrina did that in just, you know, a couple of days um, to this continued, you know, dialogue back and forth about, you know, especially this piece, who's in jail? What's the prison? Is the prison our earth? Is the prison what we're doing to the earth? Is the prison what the earth is doing to us or what we're doing to each other? Uh, I, I really am kind of, you know, fascinated by the way you structure all these pieces and in the retrospect of how they all hold together as kind of, you know, this, this oeuvre, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a singular moment but with very specific pieces kind of bringing us to the end. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you. Well, bravo to, to Joe and, and of course to you, Dawn. This has been incredible. And I know that we've have some questions. Um, people are starting to line up with questions they'd like to ask and it's just about that time. Um, so maybe I can pass the microphone over to Nick Bennett to pick up the thread here. Of course, um, I want to share what what a deep pleasure this has been, uh, Don. You know, for many of us that aren't in New Orleans or um, may not be able to see the show, this has been so wonderful to to see it here and to hear you all talking about it. So thank you. Um, we do have a good handful of questions here. So um, first, I'm going to pass the mic. Hopefully. Um, Susan, I don't, I know you uh, had to be leaving kind of soon, but maybe we'll catch you just before you have to go. But uh, Susan, I'm going to pass you the mic first. Uh, hi, hi. What an amazing uh, <laughs> display of work, Don. I've never even heard of you. I saw this an hour ago on Dan on Facebook, and I was just like, well, let's just go see what's going on. And to be just experiencing your work just firsthand on such a, a broad scale. And, and the thing that kind of brought me um, to the question was I was just asking uh, what the material use was when you have the water, uh, the panels that are leaning up against the wall for the water heights. Um, from the image, it's hard to tell, obviously we're looking on computers and stuff like that. Um, but it kind of looked like they were containers and, and I thought maybe based on some of the other pieces that were filled with water, but um, Brooklyn Rail did tell me that it was actually um, photography printed onto glass. And I, I uh, thought it would be kind of interesting to talk through that a little bit. Thank you for the question and the interest and, and for being here. The, uh, the works are two inch thick slabs of polished acrylic, the, the form, wow. and I, uh, watery image on the rear side. I've um, been intrigued with how water itself uh, creates a three-dimensionality. And I have a series called Test Tubes that inspired the kind of tech, the tech I used for this series. So I didn't use water, but I realized that if I polished the edges of this acrylic and if they were thick enough, that they too were reflective like water or the material was reflective like water. So if you're on side view, it does give you uh, the impression that it does contain a substance. Um, and, but the thickness of the slabs uh, have a lot to, to do with that. Mm -hmm. and, um, but, and then I have a protective coating on the backside of where the image is 
And the for me, it was very important, the images on the back. So it has that two inches to reflect to the surface. And, uh, but it has a protective coating on the back. Uh, it's very effective. Um, just, uh, just looking at it and obviously not in person, um, it still even has like a real movement quality to it. You know, just uh, like it, it, at the tops of the image, um, it almost looks like there's water moving and it's, it's pretty fascinating. It would definitely be impressive to see in person. Um, I did also want to just um, ask, uh, since I'm on the material question, the clowns um, that you had on the entrance to uh, the Noma. Yes. Um, what those are? Those are fantastic, and that followed through to the Mary kind of not Mary kind of image at the end. That was one of the comments. Um, but the the these kind of shifting through time um, and shifting through space figures. Uh, disintegrating, but still there, palpable, you know, still with us. Um, what what was the material, just I'm, I'm a material hound. Um, what was your execution on those? Those are a combination of, I, I did uh, photos when I was in residence at the Rauschenberg Foundation in Capitola, Florida for several months. I brought in the first responders there in 2012 and did lots of photographs in different types of suits. And I guess that was a place of origin, those photo studies. But then, um, you know, I started going deeper and deeper into space with more armature and headgear, different types of headgear. So at that point, uh, I introduced a lot of drawing digital uh, that I then scanned into uh, a layer I then did digital uh, work. I work a lot um, digitally. And so I did some uh, movement manipulations. And uh, as with the water marker, I try to blur the water at the very top to simulate motion. And yes. here, here I, I do a, some layering so that I can try to animate the two dimensional pieces. Uh, in, in person, is there any surface? Is it flat? And they're fantastic. Amazing. Oh, thank you so much. No, they're flat, but I didn't yeah. want glass on them. I almost don't mind uh, if, if people touch them because I used kind of this uh, surface that doesn't hold any oil. It's a, a mat archival uh, paper mounted to metal. But of course we can't allow touching. Uh, yeah. But I'm so uh, very pleased that um, people do th think they're reliefs. Um, and, and get up close. So that I'm glad that worked. I wanted that and... Um, yeah, very effective, very yeah. effective. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, uh, impressive work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Susan, and thank you, Dawn. Um, next, I'm gonna pass the mic over to our friend, G.E. Shorts. G.E., you should turn, you should be able to turn your mic on now. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, this is rail. Um, and I, I'm so, it's so wonderful to see this great survey beginning. It's sort of this microcosm of New Orleans and then moving out to this cosmic outlook for our, to our species. So, so happy to see that. Joe was talking a bit about it. I, I kind of, I kind of want to add a little bit on to the, uh, the question. So I know you're, you're often inspired by writers, obviously. We're talking about both the us and Plato and Dante. And of course, Milton and, and John Kennedy O'Toole, one of my favorites. Um, who and 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 what are some of your companions now in in practice? And where are you going? And who are you reading now? Oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, Jane Bennett, Timothy. I'm re I'm reading nonfiction at the moment, uh, uh, dealing with. Yeah, I'm taking a post-human journey, uh, and uh, kind of. Re, uh, re leveling the playing field between materiality and humans and uh, and humans and their dominance over nature when in fact what we have to do is not dominate but become a partner and um, so that's that's where I am right now uh, look forward to getting back to fiction but uh, 
oh, I'm missing some, there's a great, oh God, a biologist who I just, anyway, I, I am a senior now. So if I, can, if I remember the name, I'll pop it back to you. Um, well, Donna, everybody knows Donna. What's Donna's last name? Great, great uh, anthropologist, biologist. Donna Hathaway? Yes. Hardaway. Haraway, thank you. I like her uh, uh, reading book by her. Thanks for asking. Oh, thank you. Back to fiction soon. <laughs> okay. Thank you, GE and Don. Uh, next, I'm going to pass the mic to. Um, Aristides. Aristides, I hope I didn't mispronounce your name, but you can turn on your mic. Aristides, uh, that's a very good pronunciation. Don, uh, I was indeed transfixed by um, the wonderful array of images. Even though I did have the pleasure to see your retrospective, it's so amazing seeing all these uh, works one after another. And um, <clears throat> I guess I just want to acknowledge um, how many different media you've worked with and for uh, so many years. Um, I know you weren't the only artist working with so many different media, but uh, I think that you definitely push the boundaries from performance to photography to actually, that you created uh, and was this ever a challenge in maybe the market oh <laughs> totally i'm not known for anything no <laughs> no you, i i don't have that singular kind of market identity so but i'm blessed uh i, I I haven't sold much, but I've sold enough to float my boat. So there, but it has been challenging uh, because I think the marketplace wants a, a kind of an icon, you know, coming from an artist. And, um, but being conceptually based, um, I always want to say, well, here's the idea. Uh, how can I best say it? What's the best media to pull this off and to reach the public? So it, it did lead to um, you know many different types of dances and when I couldn't do it great myself I studied or brought in a collaborator so um, but yeah it's been a mixed media bag for sure. Well if I can just follow up and, and to your credit um, the work feels I know we're spending decades looking at it but it feels really fresh and um, it certainly feels like you're speaking the language of artists making art today, even though some of these pieces might be, uh, I don't know, over 30 years old. So bravo. Thank you so and much. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eris. Thank you. I, I share the bravo, bravo. Um, thank you so much for that question. Uh, next, I'm gonna turn uh, the microphone over to the Rails own Malvika. Malvika, you can turn your mic on now. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, and thank you, Don. Thank you, everyone, for this beautiful conversation. It's been so lovely hearing you speak about your work. Uh, I have a really simple question. I'd love to know what you have next. Uh, what's your biggest or wildest dream for like an upcoming project or the coming year? Well, the tools uh, escaping definition, I think I want to do a film version of that where, where these are but I didn't want to include him with Where's Mary because I didn't want to take away her significance and her luster. But I think I do want to work on a piece uh, about that. And um, I, I, I think I won't discuss the other stuff right now. It's too, uh, I'll keep working. I didn't know that I would. I thought I was gonna need a huge break and say, oh gosh, is a retrospective mean a kind of a, a degree of retirement? But it really fired me up and I am interested in uh, to continue my work. Thanks for the question. But I think, yeah, tools, this, this animation piece. Oh, wait, the other thing I wanted to include, but again, too much sometimes takes away. In the beginning of the Where's Mary piece, I wanted to start with this, 
footage I have of the inside of a contemporary plane, like we're all taking to get to city to city, but you know, the video monitors that are on the backs of the seats. So I have a piece where something appears on the back of those monitors. And I think that is also going to be a film piece. And more asteroid sculptures. <laughs> Amazing, looking forward. Thank you so much. Well, that actually perfectly leads to our next question. Um, if I may read it on uh, their behalf, but uh, John Hatch says, Brava, this is a great retrospective of a New Orlean native artist extraordinaire. Um, but the question is, what is the rotating object next to the artist in her screen? Well, to, to Nick Bennett of the Brooklyn Rails credit, in a test run, he told, everybody knew my background was just terrible for a Zoom meeting. So he said, well, get closest to your router. So I did. And when I came into this room, wouldn't you know it, the room closest to the router, I have a spinning meteor chunk. And I use this in the Where's Mary film. This, uh, these objects uh, are floating through the deep space. So this rotates at 27 seconds. Uh, one rotation is 27 seconds. And I kept it a little bit in the side frame to get me from going characteristically loquacious. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, John. Uh, it's sort of our tradition to uh, pass the mic to, uh, for our last question, to the Rails' own Fong H. Bowie, our publisher and artistic director. So, Fong, uh, passing the mic over to you. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Dan. Wow. <laughs> I was in and out. Sorry, I had a some phone call that, you know, sort of took me away from this lengthy conversation, but I will re-listen to it. We always put it on a YouTube and we always get to re-listen anytime thereafter. But um, yes, I remember Don, you and I, and definitely Lonnie dancing right after your and his beautiful collaborated ex exhibition at uh, Mass Mocha. What a time we had. That's and right. it just seeing you here talking about your work in greater depth, I just realized that's the power of the artist. That's what art does. It unifies mankind, doesn't it? I mean, I just recently thinking how lucky for having met Bo Diddley in the Live Aid concert 1985, hanging out with him and then able to ask him whether his real name is Bo Diddley. He said, no, I named myself after the Diddley Bow, one of the oldest instruments from South Africa that really, really prompted the distinct sound of Delta Blues. When you think of it, with all the sliding, open tuning, whatnot. But it's so curious how the, the great migration that created Chicago Blues that created records, then get them disseminated. And it came right back to Africa, you know? And then in the mid nineties, I went to see Rai Kuda and Ali Fakature and met them. And Ali Fakature said, yes, I grew up listening to Bo Diddley. <laughs> came right back, didn't it? Yes. So, <laughs> I don't know, just spending time with you and Holly, it's not that different than spending time with John Hammond and then Buddy Guy. You know, I, <laughs> just terrific. I just love that kind of boomerang, no more, no less than, than the way that Strength Fruit was written by a Jewish school teacher in the Bronze, remember? No, I didn't know that. No, didn't know that. Yes, Abel Marapo. Uh, his stage name is Lewis Allen. Um, yes, absolutely. Who later adopted the children of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg in the trial. Oh, so it's just the power of all of us talking about art and culture, you guys. This is what unify all of us. Not political, so-called uprising, not revolution, 
none of that we believe anymore. It's the art and the culture that does it. And we have the voice, collective voice, where each of us are so unique. Dan Cameron is so unique. Joe Lewis is unique. Don the Doe is unique. Every one single face that appear here, the poet about to read Cliff Feynman is unique. GE Swoot is unique, everyone here. And that's what we want to be, unique instrument of our own sound. And Don is a, have a symphonic sound. So let's not compete with Don here, but we are happy <laughs> that you exist in our symphonic space. Yeah, thank you so much. I can't wait to re-listen to it. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Dan, and back to you, Nikki. Well, thank you so much, Fong, for sharing that. Um, of course, I want to thank you, Don and Joe and Dan, and remind everyone in the audience that Don's exhibition at the, at the New Orleans Museum of Art is on view through January 23rd of next year. But here at, the, here at the Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today I am thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Cliff Feynman, to the stage. Cliff Feynman was born in 1954 in Greenwich Village. Leaving school, he found his way to Berkeley in 1975, where he self-educated, relying on the used bookstores on Telegraph Avenue. He attended poetry workshops at the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics in 77, and at the Poetry Project in 79. Um, after many, many wonderful things, uh, he, has, he attended workshops in the early 90s at the PP with Bernadette Mayer, and he worked on and off as a yellow taxi driver at night in NYC from 1974 to 84, and then again from 2012 to 2017. He lived in the East Village since 1979, giving many readings and publishing in magazines and anthologies. And without further ado, uh, over to you, Cliff. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. I really enjoyed that. I like the one with the earth and all the bowls. That was beautiful. And um, these poems that I'll read, um, I wrote them as a cab driver. When, when passengers got into the cab, they started talking on their cell phones. Very personal, um, very personal uh, experiences and as if I wasn't there. And I started to find them so interesting, I copied them down as uh, poems. And this first poem though was by a passenger who directed his thoughts to me directly. Driver, do you think this world is going to survive another hundred years? Tsunamis, earthquakes, frack oil drilling, slant oil drilling. We're digging in Texas, but at an angle under the Rio Grande, so we can steal Mexico's oil at a slant. Slant oil, polar ice caps melting, Ozone splitting apart. China is cheating for war. Korea wants war. 46% of Africa has AIDS. And Africa is a continent, not a country. Indians and Pakistanis, Jews and Arabs. In Florida, they had people voting who were dead 50 years. They had foreigners voting twice. It cannot, it cannot survive another 100 years. No way. I don't know what to tell my children go to college, get a good job, germ warfare, biological warfare. Give me change of this. I tip you, but it's my last bill. Have a good fucking day, my man. So that was, that was one. Beautiful. Thanks. She left him at the altar, not once, but twice. She's like wild. She's a man eater. Men, men don't. She just has men. Her aloofness drives men wild. I don't know about now, but in her 20s and 30s, they'd fall all over her. <laughs> her indecisiveness drives men wild. She never married. It's weird. She just went through men. There's some strangeness there. I pass a drug test then I think maybe I should take drugs to celebrate. Is that a, a normal thought process? Probably not. I've been studying molecular parts of the brain. 
I'm surprised you haven't called me. <laughs> before, I, before I read the next one, I'm gonna make my poem a minute poem to say what I wanted to say about the soil. I'm going back to that. It was so beautiful. And when I think of the destruction of the world, it's so violent and it's so scary, but the soil was very peaceful, each one in a different colored bowl and it was beautiful colored soil. It was very calm and uh, very, very, very peaceful. I, I felt the earth, when we pare it down to its very essence, is, is very, is, is that, is like that in the bowl, it's very beautiful. So thank you. So now I'll just continue with the poem. And this is uh, also from, from this book, Operator 911, what's your emergency? I'm a cab driver. My cab broke down on the Manhattan Bridge. Have a police car, back me up, please. No one can see me. I'm standing outside the cab, waving away traffic, upper level, going toward Manhattan. You say you're a cab driver, and what happened? My cab is disabled. Can you hear me? It's on the side going toward Manhattan. Hurry, send the police car. Can you hear me? What bridge is that? The Manhattan Bridge. What's your name? Clifford Feynman. What's your name? Clifford Feynman. Sir, you have a yellow cab. It broke down. Manhattan Bridge going toward Manhattan. Is that correct? Yes, please hurry. Three minutes later. 911, what's your emergency? It's me, the cab driver on the Manhattan Bridge. It's too late. Someone smashed into the cab. He smashed it really hard. He was going really fast. Send an ambulance. Is someone injured? He must be. He hit it really hard. Do you see he's injured? No. Take a look and see if he's injured. But everything's a mess. That's broken glass everywhere. He almost knocked the cab off the bridge. Do you see if someone's injured? I'm, I'm going around the side to look. He's gone. He's completely gone. He's gone. The driver left the scene? Yes, he's gone. I turned left at 39th and Park. A man hailed me, standing long blue overcoat. Ron Paget, poet I've revered for years. Soon as he said 10th Street and 2nd Avenue, I announced myself in the dark. Hi, Ron, this is Cliff Feynman. He cried out, surprised as I was. I reached my hand through the open partition shook his hand, declaring, this ride is free. Ron braked, oh no it isn't. You put that meter on right now or I'm getting out of this damn cab. He went for the door. I flipped the meter on. I didn't want him running out. He asked how I was doing. Practically suicidal seconds ago, now I could say, great. We chatted the whole way. Poet Dick Gallup, He's my oldest friend, Ron said, sadly, probably thinking of older friends now gone, drove cab 40 years for the same San Francisco company, got promoted to dispatcher. Tremendous, I shouted, adrenaline soaring. They had to know him well, Ron figured, after working there 40 years. We touched on a variety of subjects. Uber's cutting into 30% of yellow cab business, recent readings we'd been to. I felt transported to a state where all complaints fell away. He recalled a painter he admired who lived on my block till she passed on. Jane Wilson exhibited at the Parish Art Museum, friend to Jane Freilicker. Her husband was art critic John Gruen Weaving the wide Sienna van through a log jammed intersection, I remarked, I don't want any accidents with Ron Paget in my cab. He returned my jest with his own beam. It would be in the New York Times. When I pulled up, he asked me to sign the receipt. 
Seriously? Yes, hit sell it, he said, to the Yale Library Special Collection and get paid more for it than the cost of the ride. He shook my hand goodbye. Wow, what a ride. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cliff. Um, and I'd like to share with everyone that a review of Cliff's most recent book, Taxi Night, uh, is featured in our newly published December, January issue. So there's a chat in the link. Uh, please go check that out. Um, I also want to just post this link once more to encourage everyone to visit Don Dudeau, The Space Between Worlds at the New Orleans Museum of Art. And to thank you so much today, Don, Dan, Joe, thank you for this wonderful and illuminating conversation. It has been a, a pleasure to work with you all on this. Um, here at The Rail, uh, we do this every day at 1 p.m., um, except sometimes at a different time. So join us on Monday at 12 p.m. for a conversation on Alex Katz, featuring Mark Thomas Gibson, Josephine Halverson, Chris Martin, and Carter Ratcliffe on the occasion of the exhibition on view at Gladstone Gallery here in New York. We'll conclude with a poetry reading from Ray Armentrout. Um, but for now, I thank you all and wish you all a safe weekend and share one more congratulations to you, Don. Uh, you can now all turn on your microphones to say hello and goodbye and to wish everyone a happy weekend. Thank you all so much for, for joining. It means the world to me, thank you. Thank you, Don. 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 Thank you, Thank you, Don. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Don. Thank you, Cliff, for the reading. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hey, hey, hey Let's Fong. Catch up. <laughs> Fong, Fong my, my wife's name is Fong. <laughs> I can be your wife. <laughs> I'm whittling in any shape or form. Okay, do it <laughs> Beautiful time. Beautiful reading. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Thank, Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Have a weekend, everyone. Oh, no, yeah. and another dance soon. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We'll Plus let you know. Practice. We're going to plan a dance party. We'll let you know, Don. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ciao. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Have a weekend, you guys. Have a good right. weekend. Have a weekend, everyone. Stay safe. Bye, All right. Bye now. Ciao. Take care. Ciao.